Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Alana McGratton, Tribal Libraries Program Coordinator for the State of New Mexico. We have 19 public libraries on reservations in our state. We have a booth in the exhibit area. This is our 20th anniversary, the Tribal Libraries Program. The Native American Library Special Interest Group, which was under the New Mexico Library Association, is actually quite a bit older than that. That was founded in 1979, and if you were at the luncheon today, Janice Kuimi from the Laguna Public Library talked about Liz Wakondo, who started the library in her community and also um, was one of the founding members of the Native American Libraries. It was the round table at that time and evolved into the special interest group. So I wanted to share a little bit about that background because this collaboration that Brian Leaf and I have done came from the tribal libraries that are recognized by the state of New Mexico. And the New Mexico State Library, which is where I work, has uh, rules and regulations that we need to follow that are set by the legislature about what defines a public library. And there's a number of things, including you need to be able to provide a catalog that your patrons can see of the collection that you have. You're open to the public. You have internet access, and there's a lot of other criteria. Your community has to provide a certain amount of funding on your behalf based on your legal service area. And the collaboration developed because one of the things that you also have to have as a recognized public library in New Mexico is a community assessment, a strategic plan, and collection development policies on file with the state library. And for some time, because the funding for the state library was very compromised and the department I'm in, which is the Department of Development, is normally staffed by eight people, and for quite some time there were only two people in the Department of Development. So as long as a library had a plan on file, one of those three plans I described, community assessment, strategic plan, collection development, you were in compliance and you could get state funding. Well, that changed, and this year, in 2017, all of the libraries had to provide up-to-date plans, and pretty much every library's plan was not up-to-date. So when we started looking at a community assessment for a tribal library, I asked Brian to help us take a closer, deeper look at how we could put together a community assessment that would really inform a library as to what their community's needs were. And so I'm going to turn it over at this point to Brian because he's the one who did the major work on the community assessment. Hi everyone, I'm Brian Leaf. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator at Community Engagement Coordinator with the South Central Region of the National Network, National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Um, I really did this uh, project along with the executive director of my office, uh, Lisa Smith. Um, we are based in uh, we are based in Fort Worth, Texas. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what our office does later. Uh, but first, I just want to say, you know, this is my first time at ATOM. I'm really glad to be here, and I'm really grateful to Alana for inviting me uh, to present here today with her. Um, I'm going to, for my outcomes during my first half of this presentation, it's kind of ambitious, but um, I'm going to zoom out a little bit and describe community health needs assessment. Um, we're really a health information office. We're based out, we're based out Fort Worth. Um, I'm gonna, and then I, after I talk about what community health needs and assessments are, I'm going to zoom in on what my organization actually is. You know, why the heck is why why the heck is this tiny office in Fort Worth involved with community assessments in the first place? Uh, why are we interested in that? And then um, I'm going to zoom in even further on what this uh, on the project, what the project is, and what the features of the toolkit are. So I'll. I'll just jump straight into it. Uh, community health assessment, uh, basically if the state 
tribal, local, or territorial health assessment that identified key health needs and issues through data collection and analysis. You know, basically, um, you know, what you're trying to get in a formal way is a big picture look of, of what the state of health looks like in your community. Uh, what, what are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? Um, you know, for instance, that could be uh, the uh, prevalence of alcohol abuse among youth, um, but it could also be something positive, like who are the champions in your community who are really, uh, who are really promoting health um, in tangible ways in your community? So there's a lot of data that exists um, that exists that talks about how patrons use use libraries, and one significant way that patrons use libraries is to search for health information, especially among older adults. Um, if you're involved with ALA or PLA, you may have noticed uh, the, with, there's a new health literacy toolkit with uh, Libraries Transform. Um, PLA has had forums, and they're they're pushing a the campaign to address the opioid epidemic. Um, and so uh, I think we're seeing an increasing trend uh, with how with how libraries are really partners in are really partners in community health um, and important partners. I mean, we libraries promote literacy and equitable access to information. And if you have any background with public health, you know that that can be tied directly into social determinants of health. You know how how are communities functioning? You know what what are the sources of, of inequity? in our community, and how does that impact the quality of life within our communities. Um, we also have these, uh, there are also other benefits. So yeah, I, I, I'm talking broadly about, uh, I'm talking broadly about community health, but in terms of a community health assessment, that formal collection of data, um, you know, aside from state aid or grant funding, uh, you know, which tends to be the reason why lots of people do community health assessments. There are lots of opportunities, and that's and that's what uh, that's what we think is really important. Really, what can it, what what can it do for you aside from just the money? Um, and there are a lot of programmatic ways that that we think it can help. It makes you it puts you in a better position to partner with other community health organizations, with partner uh, with partner with hospitals. Um, or, or tribal agencies offer community health programs to the community. Um, you know, when when you know what your when you know what the what the state of health is in your community, you can start to identify expert speakers who can who can speak to health conditions and what sorts of interventions uh, might help with your community. Um, it can also help you refine your collections if you know what um, if you know what the greatest needs are in your community. So. Uh, there are lots of reasons why, why these are useful. Um, these slides will be available later and online, so you can so you can take a look. There's a lot of resources on how to do community health assessments and what their benefits are, which I'll which I'll show you in a moment. So, as a library, you know, I talked about community health assessment. I, I personally work with a lot of public health departments, and those are the types of agencies that are really doing these kinds of assessments. Um, the track for this for this particular presentation is libraries, and we're we're not saying that libraries should spearhead a community health assessment. Um, these are sort of the phases and stages uh, that are part of doing community health assessment and the implementation afterward. Um, and really think we really think it's important to be informed, and we believe libraries can definitely contribute as community partners to community to community health assessments. I say the word community a lot; it's starting to bother me right now. Um, <laughs> it's starting to sound weird in my head. But if you know what the stages, if you know what the stages are in the community assessment are, you'll know when to intercede. You know, uh, just having a seat at that table um, can be really important. So, I just want to talk, introduce a, a, a couple more terms. Um, this isn't a deep, this isn't a deep dive into community health assessments, uh, but indicators are basically data points um, that your that a community health assessment might collect. 
uh, small pieces of information that reflect uh, the status of a larger system. So, you know, as I mentioned, this could be alcohol prevalence among the youth. Um, this could be hospitalization, readmission rates. Uh, this could be the percentage um, of women who are getting prenatal care during their first trimester. Um, lots of different pieces of information. They can't tell you everything about the health of your community, but they can help you make informed decisions. Um, once you do that, and these indicators are used by tons of organizations uh, across the country by lots of different types of agencies. I'm just going to give you a small sample of what of what some of these are. Uh, the source for this, I'm not sure if you can read that, the Indian Community Health Profile Project Toolkit that comes out of Portland. Um, so lots of resources in these slides, so, so check out these slides later. Uh, here are some more sample indicators. Uh, divided by category. Uh, so we have some of the data points that I mentioned earlier, plus a few more that talk about health risk factors and positive health behaviors. Um, there are environmental factors. Uh, I, I, really like, I really like this bullet point on the bottom. Presence of tribal ordinances requiring auto, auto safety restraint use and prevalence of auto safety restraint use. So we're not just, we're, we're, we're not just talking about um, you know, things that are directly related to, you know, clinical, you know, to clinical care, right? We're talking about, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, uh, auto safety restraint use is, is a public health issue, you know, um, violence in the community uh, and, and other types of things that we might not think of. I think um, the, the former, uh, uh, I forget what his title was, um, but Dr. Vivek Mur Murphy just came out with an article um, about how loneliness in the workplace is something that he considers a huge um, public health issue to address. Here's some more sample indicators, so socio-demographics, so these are things that you might see in a more general community health assessment. Um, rate of high school graduation, uh, proportion of children who live with both natural parents, um, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, more about health status, uh, mental health and functional status. Um, so there are lots of different types of indicators. This is just an example of one. Actually, this is um, this isn't just an example of one. This is uh, these are health indicators that were taken out of. Oh, good. This is the next slide. Out of what we think is sort of a best practices model for a community health needs assessment. Um, so St. Vincent in Santa Fe, they did. Um, they do a huge community uh, health needs assessment every few years, um, and if you're ever interested, I actually wanted to print this out, but it's 90 pages, and that would be a lot to print. Um, but they have an assessment plan and an implementation plan for how they want to address community health needs um, in Santa Fe County. So this is definitely something to check out. Uh, Another resource I want to point you toward, uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC. They have a lot of great resources on community health assessment and health improvement planning. Um, so I would definitely uh, go through that. Uh, I'm not going to go into the website and, and give you a walkthrough. There are just a lot of resources out there. And what I really like about a lot of these resources, even if you're ju just doing a general community needs assessment, um, you know, there's a lot of evidence out there for, you know, for, for how they work and how you do it in a, in, in, a, in, in a focused way. What are the best practices around doing community needs assessment? And then I'm just going to show you one more resource as sort of a segue. So as I mentioned before, um, I'm part of the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Um, the U.S. National Library of Medicine has created one of their many, many resources. It's the National Information Center on Health Services Resource Research and Healthcare Technology, um, also known as NICHSR. And they also have, you know, they also have a lot of great tools for how you do community needs assessments. Um, and they have, uh, they have. A search engine that will search not only this site but a lot of uh, a lot of other uh, a lot of other uh, sites that are similar to this um, that can help you find additional tools on how you do that. Okay, so I might be speeding through here, but I want.
go ahead and pass out the actual tool so you can all look at this. Um, so I'm going to start on this side and just go ahead and pass those around. Actually, I'll take one. I'll just spread them out. We don't have a lot of copies. I can email you copies of any of the things we're showing, but just for the purpose of showing you these kinds of things, if you could share the copies that we have. Um, I have copies of the templates. Do you think it would be helpful for them to have just the blank template without oh, yeah. the added to them? Yeah, sure, that'd be so great. We started with this tool, which is a tool that we have on the State Library website to do a community assessment. And then Brian took this and enriched it by developing links that would help answer the questions in that template. So one document is the template, and the other is how we enrich the template with links to find the information asked for. And of course, that would be different for your community, but you can find information about your community very often by just going into those links and then typing in the information for your community. Okay, so, um, yeah, if you want to keep these documents, I actually do not intend to go home with any of these things I printed out or brought. So if you want one, just let me know. Um, and if and if we uh, or just keep it. And if we and if we run out today, uh, just email me and I can send you and I can send it to you. Uh, I also passed out booklets, and I'll talk about why I did that a little later. But you can keep those as well. And if you want more, I will I will mail them to you. So uh, the U.S. National Library of Medicine um, is the world's uh, largest biomedical library in the world. Uh, it started out as a tiny collection uh, in the tent of the U.S. Uh, Army Surgeon General in 1836. And over the last 150 years, it's grown a lot. It's now, uh, it's now a print collection and electronic collection that's searched by it searched billions of times by millions of people around the world, um, and it's located on the National of Institutes, the National Institute of Health campus in Maryland. Um, there's a Harvard study that was done in the 1960s uh, that basically demonstrated that the health information infrastructure in the United States was terrible, and we needed to figure out. We needed to figure out a way of um, making sure that uh, medical centers, hospitals, other, other types of clinics were getting the right types of health information. So what they did, what they signed into law, was the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, um, which was basically a model where you had a lot of sort of these central resource, uh, what's it, these central sort of resource libraries. Um, what we call regional medical libraries, or RMLs, and they were responsible, they were usually housed on a large medical center with a huge capacity, or with the capacity uh, to distribute information. Um, and there used to be something like 16, uh, but now there are about eight RMLs around the United States, um, and our scope has changed over time. So rather than just disseminating health information, uh, health information and functioning as sort of a uh, interlibrary loan unit, um, our scope has broadened. You know, uh, our mission is now to advance the progress of medicine and improve public health through increased access to health information. Um, and I'm in the South Central region. I'm based out of the South Central region, so that's number five on the map, Fort Worth, Texas. Um, our office is in particular responsible for Arkansas, Louisiana, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas, which tells you a little bit more about why I'm here um, and, why, and why we're working on this project. Uh, we're based at the University of North Texas Health Science Center. So you can kind of see the progression. So we have National Institutes of Health on the top, National Library of Medicine, which is the world's largest medical library. Um, then we have the National Network, those eight offices that you saw on the slide before. 
Um, and then I'm part of the South Central Regional Medical Library. So as an office, we have part of my elevator pitch when I usually go out to meet people or go to conferences like this one um, is three things. First is grant funding. Um, anything from $2,000 for, uh, for, for individuals within, within an organization within our five states um, to be a part of to be a part of the national network. By the way, it's like signing up for email. You have to agree to receive email from us, and then um, you sign up. You sign up for that on the website, um, and then you're eligible for all of these offerings. Uh, so that's two thousand dollars for individuals looking to get training or professional development um, related to health and data science, all the way to forty thousand dollars for programmatic efforts. Um, the second thing we offer is education and training, such as monthly webinars, uh, and this is again all free. We're a grant-funded office, um, and, but we also offer face-to-face -face training and online classes as well. And then project partnerships. So this, the types of project partnerships we do, um, we're a relatively new office. We've we've only been around for a year and a half, and so we're open to a lot of different project partnerships if, if, it, fit our, if it fits our scope. Um, so one of the projects we're working on right now is working on workforce training uh, for, for the Public Health Department in Louisiana. Um, and then at the beginning of this year, uh, or actually at the end of last year, uh, was, was uh, developing this community assessment tool. So this is me. Um, uh, with a little less hair uh, back in November 2016 um, and my executive director Lisa Smith uh, we were visiting uh, we were attending the New Mexico Library Association conference and that's where we met Alana um, and she kind of she kind of talked at the beginning about uh, you know how we discovered that there was this requirement for a strategic plan and a community assessment uh, um, tool and collection development policy uh, to be turned in and we thought this would be a really really great uh, a really really great opportunity for us to start to build inroads in a relatively new office so this is this is just the New Mexico State uh, library page which I think you'll you'll take a look at more a little later um, so again why community assessments you know we already talked about grant applications uh, they're usually uh, you know, they can help improve your ability to get grants, you understand your community better, um, and they also, it also promotes community collaboration, which are all the things that we mentioned. Uh, but they also do other things, you know, when people talk about, I, I don't know the experience of everyone in this room with community assessment, but sometimes, um, sometimes when people do hear the word community assessment, they see it as something uh, that is just intended to like figure out what's wrong with the community, but we also see it as figuring out what's right with the community, too. Right? We also see it as a way as of confirming or refuting perceptions. So lots of people may say, "Well, I know my community. Well, have you collected that data in a formalized way that you can actually document and show to ex to stakeholders or external funders? You know, um, can you compare to what? Can you compare your community?" Uh, what it is today to what it was you know, five years ago. Um, and again, who, who, what are the strengths of your community or uh, in the lingo of community assessment, what are your community assets? Uh, what are the resources? Who are the people um, that are really doing great things that you can potentially partner with? Okay, so now I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go straight into the toolkit. I know this is like, you know, the 20,000 foot view of everything. Um, but basically when we decided to do this, we didn't know how we were going to, we, we didn't know how we were, we were going to support this document. Uh, we had a lot of ideas. This was one of the first major projects that we were working on as an office. Um, and you know, being, being a community service organization, as, as all of you know, you can't just go in someplace and say, Hey, we want to help. You know, it takes. It takes a lot of uh, it takes a lot of relationship building. Um, it, 
takes that it, it, it takes time to build trust. But we were so we were really trying to explore different ways of how we could help. We thought maybe maybe we could hire an intern or something to you know to actually to actually go into the region or or someone who's already on site to go into the region. Um, we were trying to figure out if if grants would help. Um, and after a lot of discussions and talking on the phone with Atlanta, we realized that you know probably the best way we could uh, the best way we could help was to update the documents. Um, so you all got the copy of the actual toolkit and the templates uh, and the template that already existed. And the first thing that we found was that you know not all the links were updated was was updated on the site uh, or updated in the template rather. And. I just want to take another quick tangent. Um, I actually just got back from the, uh, you know, speaking of building relationships and building trust. Um, getting data, if you've ever tried to do research around this, you know, trying to get data out of tribal communities can be very hard because of historical issues, because of a, a, a lack of understanding of sovereignty. Um, and, and the list goes on. Uh, but I was recently in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma, actually I was there last week for a week, um, and I, I was at their Public Health Association conference and I discovered this really cool thing. This is the American Indian Data Community of Practice. Um, and it's, it's a huge collaboration. It's basically a bunch of people uh, within tribes and out of tribes who got together and realized, hey, this data is scarce, it hasn't been collected well, or you know, or 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 certain nations or certain tribal nations aren't willing to share the data. How do we start to bring this data together? Um, and so they started a community of practice. You know, uh, basically they meet once a month and talk about what they want to do and how they can get that data and how they can share data. And um, I guess it's it's been really it's been really successful so far. This is just. Uh, this is this was part of it. This is like the top half of the infographic uh, from one of their promotional materials. But um, it, I just thought to, it it really speaks uh, it, it really speaks to what we can do when we collaborate and work together. And to that point, you know, as the South Central Regional Office of the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, you know, we have this toolkit. Um, we can update links, but we also know that. As an outside office that has no relationship, um, or or you know, not a current real relationship with anybody in New Mexico, ex save one conference in November, um, we're not going to be able to presume to collect, you know, be able to collect ro robust data or um, or to come up with all the tools that can help people do this. So as you look through the toolkit and as I talk about these things, you'll see a lot of you'll see some annotations within that that says. We can't get this data. This is something that you have to do. This is, you know, these are interviews that you know need to be conducted internally. Okay, so going back to the actual toolkit, I kind of divided this into four sections. Um, the first, the first section is community assessment data points. So this is essentially uh, the template as is. So if you download the state library template, what we did is we went through the entire document um, and. You know, we updated links where there were updated links, and where there weren't updated links, um, or or where documents didn't exist anymore because you know technology changes quickly, and so do websites. Um, you know, we really dug deep into into local projects. Anyone who had an online presence, you know, uh, U.S. Census data, um, publications, uh, Chamber of Commerce documents, uh, to figure out um, a lot of these things. So, so that's reflected in the documents there. Uh, but then, you know, as as a as a health information office, we thought we would, you know, so we, we had the basic level of just the community assessment template. But then we want to do sort of, uh, you know, what do things look like at the platinum level? If you have time and you're, if you're inclined, um, we're an outreach office. This is the type of work that 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 we like to do because. We really see the benefit um, uh, of you know wanting to partner. We wanted people to you know have a launching point if they wanted to pursue further collaborations or pursue further programs beyond just the template. 
So this is where the supplemental community health data assessment comes in. And this is where, we're, where we start to ask questions um, you know, that I talked about earlier. You know, you know, what, what, are those, what are those additional data points that you could possibly collect as you're doing your community assessment? Um, and I've already talked about sort of the health, the health statistics. Uh, but when you, have the, when you have that sort of data, uh, you know, maybe you can start to set priorities around, uh, around community health. Or maybe just seeing what community health priorities are, like in that St. Vincent document I was showing you, you know, I'll give you an idea of, of how you might form strategy uh, around your more general community health assessment. Um, number three, uh, so the supplements, uh, we also have supplements in that toolkit. So we have a template for interviewing stakeholders. We have a health programming action plan and additional resources. The toolkit's really resource heavy. So aside from updating links, we want to provide additional resources. Um, you know, our, our job is not to, to complete this assessment for people, but to point them really towards the best resources. So what, what are the best practices around community assessment? What are the best practices around interviewing stakeholders? And if you have any questions, you can always you can always uh, email us about how you might go further with your community assessment. Um, so number four. Uh, so when we were when we were still trying to figure out how to support this community assessment tool, uh, we wanted you know we, we didn't want to leave Atlanta hanging. Um, and so there are a few different things that we did. One of those things is those booklets that uh, were going around, I think there are two sets of booklets um, that really go into community programming, community assessment, um, and how you strategize around community programming. So I, I think we sent like a box of 20 uh, to Atlanta. And then um, th that was just a month following our meeting. And then two months after, two months after we met with Atlanta, we found we found an expert in community assessment who just happened to be on our campus, and we did a one and we did a we did a one hour webinar with her um, to do that. And that webinar is also available online, so there's a link to the recording there. Um, so along the way, as we're trying to partner, you know, it, it, it's not just the big tool that you know, it's not just the big tool that we created, you know, but trying to but trying to you know add value along the way and just help in whatever way we can um, so here's just the basic timeline New Mexico Library Association conference was in 2016 we emailed those outreach project workbooks in December um, in January that's when the webinar was February is when we finally you know after three months of meetings on top of those on top of those other things we finally figured out how we could help and then by the end of March, we had to deliver the uh, community assessment template and guide. Um, and you know, we, we were moving kind of quickly because we knew the assessments were due in June of 2017. Um, so we wanted to give people time to give people time to explore the workbooks, use them um, if they felt like they could, um, and ask us questions if they needed to. Uh, and yeah, so. So yeah, so 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 the last time you know, so the last time we really looked on the, looked at this was March, but um, you know it, it moved it moved really really quickly, and uh, I just want to use that you know you know sort of get back to the our service offerings. You know that's the type of assistance um, that's the type of assistance we want to provide if people want to if people want to use us. Whenever I'm out on the road or doing site visits with people, you know I always say that. As an office, um, you know we're you know we're state employees. You know our our mission is to serve the community, um, and we just want to be an extra limb for organization. You know er everyone's trying to do a lot of work. We're you know you know we want to serve as like an extra arm or extra leg if you need it. Okay, that was a that was a lot of information, and I'm not even sure where I was on time. But if you have any questions or you. Oh, 440. Okay. If you have any time or you want to work with us in any way, you know, we're, 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 we're open to the world of possibilities. We might not be able to execute the world of possibilities for you, but we're definitely here. We're definitely a resource. As I mentioned, 
Uh, we're in the South Central region, so we're just we're just a five-state region that includes New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, um, and Arkansas. But we have offices all over the U.S. Um, so if you just email me, I can connect you to the right person. For any of those resources I was talking about, you can also email me, as well as for the slides. Um, and then our website is also nnlm.gov. That's National Networks of Libraries of Medicine.gov. Um, you can also keep up with our news, become a network member there. Um, and yeah, so I guess that's my part. So, uh, so th that's my perspective. Now you'll get the land. Thank you. Thank you. So um, this was a very uh, specific piece of helping to develop plans and policies that are required for libraries. And when you stop to think about it, if you don't do a community assessment, how can you really develop a strategic plan? And how can you really develop a good collection development policy? Because you really need to understand your community to be able to do those other things. So um, these are slides that were taken from the website for the New Mexico State Library. I'll direct you to those there at the end of this presentation. And they're um, planning documents, toolkits, and webinars that we provided in the spring for all of our public libraries in New Mexico to help guide them through the process of doing these different plans and policies that are re required. So, the last part of this slide, keep in mind that the community analysis and needs assessment should direct all other plans and policies, which was why when I saw an opportunity to go in depth about that and partner with Brian and his organization, I wanted to take advantage of that opportunity. So you're learning about your community to find out who your patrons are. And Brian's piece, which is the health piece, is one part of that, but um, another place that we got a lot of information for our communities was Kids Count. Kids Count Data Center. How many of you are familiar with that organization, Kids Count? Well, anybody here from New Mexico? And you know, well, no. Well, New Mexico is like at the bottom of the list. Yes, you are. <laughs> New Mexico is at the bottom of the list when it comes to kids health and wellness and kids' quality of life. So at the bottom of what list? Where? And this is the place to look for that information. Kids count. And this is a national database and the Annie Casey Foundation um, supports that. So it, it uses data and ana analyzes data and it's updated yearly. So even though the census is done every decade, there's also a community census that's done every year and they use that information to inform you about your community about the state of New Mexico. So for instance in the Kids Count New Mexico book I can look under each tribe and it will tell me information about that community. Um, what's the child poverty rate? What's the dropout rate? What are some health issues in that community? So Kids Count is a really important place to look to find out about your uh, tribal community. You can also discover what other organizations are providing similar services. That's another reason to do a community needs assessment. You might find out that there is an initiative very nearby that's helping and providing resources for high school dropouts. So if you do an analysis of your community, you'll find out about those resources and you can begin to partner and therefore better serve your community and anticipate needs of your changing community. So if you do a statistical analysis and you see that you have a large population of birth to three-year-olds, as a librarian, you better start planning for when those children are now three to five. Are you gonna have STEM programs, pre-literacy programs, et cetera? So your demographics, they're fixed at a certain point, but they help you plan for the future for what your future needs will be. And it's also a good document, as Brian touched on, to seek funding from other places. Like if you have two elements in your community assessment where you can show that you have a really large population of preteens, 
and there's a large high school dropout rate and you want to provide a program through your library that's in, going to encourage those students to have school success so that they're going to continue to graduate from high school. With the statistics that you're providing, you can help uh, shore up a document looking for those kinds of funds. Um, and then it becomes, and this is the transition point, it's the foundation for your collection development and your strategic plan. So what are some things that you want to include? Government agencies, educational systems, support services and organizations, trade and industry, where are the people in your community employed? What kind of jobs do they have? And then the key demographics, which we spent a lot of time on, and then a vision statement. What is your library there for? What is the purpose? And what is your vision for the future for your community and the library in your community? There's a handout over here with links to U.S. Census data, America Fact Finder, New Mexico Economic Development that refers to our state, the New Mexico website, um, Chamber of Commerce. Beaver is something that UNM has where they do a great deal of collection of data about New Mexico. And then New Mexico PED, where you can get the information about schools and uh, situations with the schools. This is the Kids Count database. And so here's the profile for 2017. And this is going to be um, redone for 2018 in the spring. But it talks about um, a fact sheet about kids in New Mexico and some of the issues with regard to children in New Mexico. And you can also get to a part of the site where you can actually go into an individual community or an individual tribe. So here are percentages about uh, children at or below the poverty level. And it's worse than the US average. It has improved since 2014 when it was 29%. But all of these percentages and all of this data is a snapshot of what the children in the communities that you are serving, if you're in New Mexico, are facing. Okay. So then this is the national database, the data center kids count .org, and this will get you information about wherever you're from, whatever state you're from. And then American Fact Finder is another tool. Okay, so now I'm shifting to a different part of my presentation, and this is one of the things that I have been um, really trying to focus on since I first started in 2013 with the State Library. I had previously been at the Santa Fe Indian School and worked for the All Pueblo Council of Governors. And, and so there, the educational approach at the Santa Fe Indian School is not the same as public education of New Mexico Department of Education. And it's based on a lot of community input, community meetings, um, and it was very hard to be able to grasp what is it really about the Santa Fe Indian School and the way it gathers information about the community and the way it's involved in the community that has led to its success. And so taking that particular perspective, I first um, met with Valerie Nye from the Institute of American Indian Arts Library and I asked her, how do you do your community assessments? What is, what is a Native American perspective about doing a community assessment? And so I have handouts here from IAIA and resources that they shared with me, but this was the basic um, description of how she did her most recent community assessment. So it starts with the community gathering. And with the community gathering that has um, foundation points of respect, community dialogue, and honoring so that every voice is heard and everyone is welcome. And then they take the things that come out of that community gathering and then begin to build on that how they want to um, develop a library program that is responsive to their community. So this is a different kind of model than gathering statistics. 
this is a this is a model that comes from engagement and conversations with your community. So the other uh, institution that I have been working with, and this is in much more depth and much more extensively because this is where I spent 35 years of my career, and now my students are now running the school, which is really great to see, and some of my students are running the libraries in their communities, which is very um, great to see. So this is something that's in progress, it's in flux, it's nothing fixed, it's just something that they're working on and I'm working on it with them. And the first is the individual-led assessment. In other words, an individual is engaged in their community and gathers information from their community that then, this actually was changed, and it's changed on the handout. But I saved the wrong version of it on the flash drive. But it does deal with individual assessment. And right now at the Indian School, they have um, PhD programs that are a collaboration with um, NAU. And they graduated 12 PhDs, and they have more PhD cohorts that are engaged now. And so the leadership institute at the Indian School has been working with those students those PhD candidates to begin to do some of this work in their communities. And so the next is an issues-based community institute assessment that's led by teams of 40 in a convener think tank model. So you first take this information that's gathered and some of it's statistical and some of it might be narrative. Then you bring that to a larger population um, and they have these community institutes that are issues-based. The last one they had had to do with art in the communities and art as livelihood in the communities. So there's different issues, and we're having another um, um, meeting in the spring, and the libraries are gonna be a big part of that convening in that meeting. So then it's sort of a think tank model. Then you move to a broader perspective with the cross-tribal community-wide assessment, and then that's the Pueblo Convocation model. So the Santa Fe Indian School is thinking through this assessment and how it would start with some initial information gathered by cohorts and college students and community members. Then it's brought to a little broader community, but still you know, a limited number. And then it goes to the wider community in a convocation type model. So this is just, trying to get a hold of community assessment from a Native American perspective, which is, it's, uh, it's exciting, it's challenging, but I don't really have it fixed in stone. We're just working with these different models. Okay, so the other thing that uh, a library has to have and is informed by all this information gathered in the community assessment is a strategic plan. Once you know your community better, and once you have that basic information, then you're developing a strategic plan. So what is, what, what is the direction? What are the decisions that you need to make to allocate what the resources are that you have? Because you might have a vision about where you wanna go, but you also have to take into account what are the resources that you have at this time. And so the purpose of this is to set overall goals for your library and then how you're going to achieve those goals. What are you gonna do to get there? So you have a mission statement, why you exist. Why does your community have a library? And what is your library gonna look like in the future? It's not just now, but long range in the future. What are your guiding principles? Some of our community libraries are very engaged in language and culture. Others of our community libraries um, the decision has been made within that community that the library is not part of that, that that is something that is um, in other departments in the community. So it's important to know your community well and know what is comfortable in your community. And some of our libraries are, and you can see from the videos, we have five libraries profiled and we have at our booth five five minute videos about those communities. And you can see each one is different. Um, and then what are your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? 
So as you begin to make this plan, you also need to be able to position yourself to build on your strengths, fortify your weaknesses, take advantage of your opportunities, and be prepared for your threats. Like in a description that I just suggested, you might have decided that you want to do a language program in your library, but maybe there are people in your community that are not going to be comfortable with that. So how do you position yourself so that you can uh, be prepared for those kinds of challenges? And then the competitive advantage, this comes from the State Library website. Um, what can you do better than your competition? So if there are things in your community that are already happening and are successful, collaborate with them, but don't duplicate what they're doing. And what are your long-term objectives and how are you going to reach them? And what methods are you going to use to get there? And what are your short-term priorities? You know, maybe your, maybe your short-term priority is just to develop a program because you see you have a large spike in births, so you have birth to three-year-olds, a large number. So what is your immediate goal for developing plans to meet that group of students, that, that, those, that population? And how will you get there? And then always along the way, measure what it is you're doing. Find some way, even if it's anecdotally or just narratives, of, of how what you're doing, measure it so you know if it's, if it's successful. Okay, so this is what I spent the smallest amount of time on, which is the collection development, because I actually did quite a, a long session on that, and we're almost at the end now, which is good. But it's based on the community assessment and your strategic plan. You have to take into account space and budget. Please be sure to have a weeding and donations policy. I had a situation at the Indian School where the principal got a phone call from some book distributor and said, we have semi-trucks of books we want to donate to your school. They're brand new. They showed up at the trucks. I told the principal, please don't take them. We don't know what they are. And she did. And it was 500 copies of Milton Burrell, P.S. I Love You. I mean, we had to take this stuff to the dump. So be really careful that you don't have people dumping things on you because you're a tribal library and my goodness, you have such needs because you don't know what kind of junk you're going to get. And also a donation policy so that when people give you things, you can say, okay, fine, thank you, but we have the right to say what we're going to do with it. Use vendors that provide MARC records in small tribal libraries. You don't have time to catalog books. Include a policy for reconsideration of your materials. And then these are the two links to the State Library website, which has a lot of the information more elaborate than what I've just shared with you now about how to put together these plans, including a webinar on each one, a webinar on community assessment, a webinar on collection development, and strategic plan. Thank you.